Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hey. Great. Okay, perfect. Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay, so I guess we can get started then. It's perfect. One one p.m. Okay, so everybody, thank you so much. We're gonna do. Oh, is my Wi-Fi okay? And we're gonna do the student panel now. And um, so, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. But before we get started, I, I would love if you can all introduce yourself, maybe starting with um, Riza. Um, actually, before Riza goes, I just want to say Riza is the reason why I joined podiatry, because um, I didn't really know about podiatry until um, I heard from Riza that she was joining uh, the SMU uh, school. And that really got me interested. So yeah, Riza, can you do your introduction, please? Thank you so much, Miko. That's really flattering. I'm very happy you join us. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Raisa. I am a, I guess in a week, I'll be a four-year podiatry student. So thank you. Very excited to be here. I am originally from Peru, came here 11 years ago, and I've always wanted to pursue medicine. So when I learned a little, a little bit more about podiatry, um, just not only the service you can do with a community, but also the different aspects to the profession got me excited. So yeah, it's been a good journey. Thank you. Oh, Belinda next. Hi, um, hi everyone. So I'm Belinda. I'm a second year going into a third year. So I'm in that like in between. Um, you know, studying for boards and stuff. So it's kind of like an exciting time. <laughs> um, so I actually um, am the first in my family to go to college. I'm the first one to be born in the U.S. Um, I always wanted to be a doctor, but I never really knew what kind of doctor I wanted to be. Um, and so my journey was nonetheless non-traditional whatsoever. Like I didn't go into medical school right after undergrad. I went to Cal State Dominguez Hills for undergrad. I know someone in the chat asked um, if we can mention which school. And then after that, I was really having a hard time trying to take the MCAT and trying to get the prereqs to go into medical school. So I actually took the MCAT four times. Um, but before the last two times of taking the MCAT, I actually went and took a master's at Western. And when I did my master's, I took the MCAT again, thinking I was going to go into a dual school. And during my master's, I got exposed to podiatry even more so because the master's program was actually a pre-health professional um, program. So we actually were exposed to other professions. And that's where I learned a lot more about podiatry and became a lot more interested. So then going into my fourth time of taking the MCAT, this at this point, I was like, I'm going to go to podiatry. And I ended up getting the score I needed. And I ended up joining podiatry. And I have never regretted my, my decision the, up till now. It's been a great decision. And I think things happen for a reason. Yay, uh, Jessica. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica. I go to Western U. And I came from University of Washington. And I graduated with ba uh, a bachelor's in biology. But I graduated with that, knowing I wanted to do pre-med, but I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted. So I had three gap years and I spent that time doing different, trying out different fields. So I worked as a medical scribe, I worked as a CNA, I worked as a pharmacy uh, assistant and a teacher's assistant at University of Washington. And eventually, I none of them really was speaking to me. So I met with my community college uh, advisor and she recommended podiatry and I had no idea what podiatry was. So she told me what it was and it ended up checking off all the things on my list. Like I love surgery. I love, um, I love just, I love medicine in general, sciences and I love working on plans with people and being autonomous. So podiatry really spoke to me and I attended the uh there was a fair with all nine schools at the time there was only nine schools and they just told me more things so 
love it here. <laughs> Great. And then Kosi. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kosi Senagwe, and then I, I would say I'm like an international student, but I'm a US citizen, so I'm like within both. Uh, so I grew up in West Africa, Togo. So Togo and Ghana, they are like the same place. So if you see, if you had like, you guys ever heard of Ghana, that's like, it's the Togo and Ghana, they are like California and then Arizona, pretty much. Pretty much. And then, but Togo speak French, Togo is a Francophone country and then and Ghana is English. So, but, so I grew up there and um, at the age of 18, 17, I moved to the US to pursue my education. And then, um, so I originally, I, I stayed in Dallas and I finished my high school there. And then I went to Louisiana to uh, get my undergrad in biochem biochemistry. So I did four years of biochemistry. And then I came back to Dallas to do a, a research on malaria on um, at UT Software and at the medical school. They have a PhD and MD program combined over there. So I did, I work in as a, a research assistant in the pharmacology department. So we research on malaria. Reason why I decided to research on malaria is I grew up in West Africa and malaria is like one of the big uh, infectious disease that really, you know, I grew up getting mal malaria. It's like, you get it like, at least once every month, and then they give you the anti-malaria and then you are cured. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do a research to, you know, at least I can find a cure for malaria, but I didn't know that, okay, finding a drug is got to go through a long process. So, and then I ended up, okay, this is going to take my whole life to find a cure for malaria. Why if I just do something in medicine that really take care of people? So I started uh, thinking about, med schools or anything that medic medically related. So I left the job at UC Southwestern and I went to WashU St. Louis to get my master's in biology. And then I was narrowing down my medical profession, what I want to be. So when I was taking the MCAT, they asked me, okay, if I want to, to be sent information on all other health profession. So I got an email from Kent State about podiatry. I was like, what's podiatry? So I just went and I researched about it. It's like, so I was okay, it's, you still learn about medicine and you can do pretty much anything, but you are more focused on food specialists, but you can, it's related to upper extremity too. I was like, okay, that's really cool. So I, I applied to all the night school and then I got it, I got into Bring most of them, and then including the um, Samuel Merritt. And the reason why that's, I look up the Samuel Merritt, they have really good alums that are really prominent. So, and then I say, okay, if I come to Samuel Merritt, I do my work, I got my degree, I have a higher chance to be one of the big alums too. That's one of my reasons. And then also my second reason is like, I'm really adventurous. I want to like live in California. I know so like I grew up in a tropical weather. I don't like the cold at all. So I was okay, let me let me try to see if and then beside the expenses, it's been it's been good so far. I'm finishing my first year here, um, then um going to second year. So um it's going well. I just keeping up with the coursework and then you know um doing my job as a medical for that medical student. So that's that's pretty much a short story of uh, where I'm from and where I'm at now. Great. Thank you, Kasi. Um, yeah. And Raisa, I wanted you to also explain a little bit more about your journey here too, um, to where you are now. Yeah. So I was born and raised in Peru. Um, I was born in Chiclayo and then we moved to Lima with my mom. And so I lived in Lima until I was 18. Uh, the process of coming here took about eight years for getting our visas ready and all that. So I think only people that have immigrated here know that long journey of just coming to America. But afterwards, uh, I went to community college, started 
because I had an idea. I really wanted to be a, a doctor. So I went to community college in Las Positas College here in Livermore. And then after that, I went to San Jose State and did my bachelor's in arts. I did uh, global studies with a concentration in human rights because I was really, um, I think what really caught my eye was service to the community and public health and a, a, a lot of different aspects of medicine. But I really wanted to explore the uh, other, other social aspects more. So that was really nice because I got to travel a lot and that, that was a great time. After that, I needed to complete more of my pre-med requirements. So I went back into uh, Contra Costa College and that's where I met Miko. Um, so we did there two years or I did there two years and then I worked at the same time, those two, three, three years I was working full time and doing all my requirements and trying to just save up a little bit of money because as we all know, applying for medical school is very expensive. Mm-hmm. So we did that, took our time, and then I got into Samuel Mary. It just it, it happened to be a great choice. First, me, my family is in the Bay Area. They have been here for about 30 plus years. And just having the support and the community, this I, I immigrated to this place makes me feel really comfortable. So it's been great. Great. Okay, so I have a question. So how was um, the transition into podiatry school for for all of you? Was it difficult? Was it easier than you expected? Um, yeah, just talk a little bit about like the first few months of what grad school podiatry school was like for you. Uh, let's start with Belinda. All right, um, so for me, I would say, let me see if my internet, is it okay? Yeah, it's okay. 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 Um. So for me, it was, um, it wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be, but only because I had done a master's. So, um, before going into podiatry school, I actually had mentioned I did a master's in medical sciences. That master's was specifically to get us trained for medical school. So we were having all of the tough classes. Um, and it was the same professors from the medical school that were teaching those classes. So like we would have faculty from the medical school at Western, we would have faculty from the optometry school, from the dentals college. So they already had put that kind of rigor in us. So during my master's, I struggled a lot because at this point, this is like the first time actually taking professional classes. Um, So it was really my time to try to figure out how to learn. And then once I graduated from my master's, I actually didn't go into podiatry right away. It took me about three years. And honestly, I feel it was a matter of me just being afraid to apply. And more than anything, it was me being afraid to take the MCAT again. After um, graduating with my master's, I went into teaching at a community college. So I worked as a professor. And that helped me in the sense that I was still keeping up with the material, but it, of course, it's not the same as medical school material because I was teaching at the community college level. So once I started medical school, and then it, it was difficult in the beginning, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be because I had some background already. And the fact that I had been teaching those three years, I had been seeing the material. So I was kind of well knowledge in some of those background information. But I know if I wouldn't have been doing that, I would have struggled a lot more. So it was more of a transition that took a long time. It was like spread out within like four years of me trying to prepare to get into medical school. And if it wasn't for those four years in between, I probably would have, I honestly, I probably would have dropped out the first day because of how difficult it was. It really is a matter of learning how to learn. And I know it sounds ironic, but until you know how you learn, that's how you'll be able to manage going through the actual process. If you don't know how you're able to learn or what works for you, then you're going to struggle a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, What about for Riza? How was the first bit of medical school for you? The first year was definitely challenging. And I think, uh, you know, at that time, um, my friends can testify that in my family, I, there was a lot of learning, like Belinda said, you need to learn. And in my case, um, I had to figure out because 
no one method work, multiple things were working. So I was trying at the same time, there's so many courses that you have to stay on top of. So um, I used to spend sometimes the weekends or some afternoons in the weekends, if there was a little time to just maybe make a song for biochemistry or try to see um, what could work better during that time. And um, especially as English being my, my second language, also just learning how to write better, communicate better. I think what helped me a lot too was that before joining medical school, I had almost every job that you can think of under the sun. So um, I served tables at restaurants. So that helped me a lot with, you know, having the patience to just listening to for, for long periods of times and have patience with myself, with people in general. Um, retail, another thing, um, I don't know, like I, I work at uh, labs to just, you know, washing dishes at labs, things like that. So every job I took a skill and that skill went into school, applying it every single time that I took a course. So that gave me confidence and strength to not give up. Just it's like, you know what? This is just, just move forward. You know, it's another, another challenge. So just being strong mentally, I think helps a lot. Mm, yeah, definitely. I agree. What about you for, for you, Jessica? What was the beginning of your podiatry? Um, journey like for maybe the first six months it was a little difficult for me because I was out of school for three years but just because it was difficult didn't make it impossible I feel like you make a lot of friends in school you gain support the professors care your mentors care about you they're willing to help you give you tips and there's a lot of other resources too they provide like I don't know about um, CSPN, but like to, like free tutoring also, which is really nice. No one wants to see you fail. So it is difficult at first. It is a medical school, but over time you will learn like what Belinda said, you will learn to learn. I know the way I used to study in undergrad is not the same way I study now. And it was kind of a hard, it was hard for me to take that. I needed to change the way I need to study, but you will learn in the end and you'll you'll be able to transition. Just don't let the first few months deter you. <laughs> That's good advice. And Kosi, about for you? Oh, for, for me, it was um, discipline. It was, it, it was hard. I mean, uh, I'm finishing my first year. So it, it was hard, but I find out that if I've put in the work, you know, I'm st stay disciplined and then just really, really apply myself. You know, you, you will you will see the result. Uh, that's that's just for me. Mm -hmm. So because I have the the resources, so I don't have an excuse. I'm healthy. I have the resources. I just need to like apply myself. So it, it's hard because the way the professor will ask the question that they will make you think. So. What helped me when when I'm studying, I would think about what kind of question they can ask me. I don't just memorize it. I think about it. I will be able to understand it fully. So um, the first year is hard. I don't know. I was talking to Nico yesterday. She kind of like second year is another another beast. So I'm ready for it. <laughs> and then Nico makes great Enki. So I really use 50% base Enki. So M Miko helps a lot. So she kind of gave us all her Enki. So that really, really helped me. So that's what I'm saying. Like the resource I have and then I'm healthy. So I have, don't have any, no excuse. I just need to apply myself. <laughs> so uh, Miko, you know, part of my success of, of, during the first year is like, Nico's Enki helped me a lot. <laughs> and then also just applying myself because Nico could have given me her Enki. I won't, I won't, I'll study, I won't study it. So um, it, it's a lot, but, you know, if you really apply yourself, you remember, okay, you are doing this for the patient. You really, really need to know the detail. You really need to know, you know, the material. Then 
just I think about the end goal and I really apply myself. And I know that, okay, whatever I'm putting five hours straight into just studying, studying is temporary, right? It's, it's going to hurt. You're going to apply yourself. You say, what I'm going to do, but it's temporary. No one ever um, take the test and I still feel feeling like the, the restriction of studying, studying. You, you're going to take another exam bed. Once you take the exam, you have your A, you have your, your B solid, you'll be happy that you did it. So it's rewarding. So that's kind of like, I kind of reward myself. Okay, I'm going to get a good grade. I'm not doing this for anything. So it's just a, you know, discipline. That's what I would say. It's hard, but discipline will kill it. I agree. Um, yeah, I wanted to also talk a little bit, especially with Rise and Belinda about being a first generation student or Kosi and Je Jessica, do you, are you first gen too? Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh my, everyone. Oh, perfect. Oh, great. Then I would love to, for everyone to, um, to say a little bit about maybe some of the struggles as a first generation student and how you were able to overcome that. Um, we can start with Riza. Okay, so as first generation student, um, definitely your family cannot relate to anything you're going through. You can just go after a full month of full exams and even if you're burned out, you still get some questions. And, oh, why didn't you come to the party the other day? You know, or what happened to the family stuff? And I mean, I still have family members asking me what type of nursing I'm doing that takes like seven plus years or so. So <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely hard because you do not have the support in that matter. But I think I always keep my mind into positive mode. So what's the process of that? Probably one, there is no much pressure from them. So that's a good one because they don't know much about it. Um, second, they can maybe, you can find support through other sources, right? In my, in my case, I started shadowing an amazing podiatrist right here in Concord, Dr. Colin Kenny. And she became my mentor by the start of year one of podiatry school. And also I started working with her. So every time I would feel burnout or something about classes or I just didn't feel because I was we were in pandemic right we were like 2020 so two years we were at school without going to school physically so we were sitting in front of the computer for hours at the time all day every day for the first two years so sometimes it's okay you don't have to sit down there you go do something right for me my my time was I'm gonna text my mentor what she's doing in her practice and she'll always be like come over come over. So um, I'll catch up with classes later, but I will be already working and seeing patients with her. And that helped me so much to improve not only my skills, um, you know, when practicing podiatry, but also just mentally to get a little break from just the dry classes of first and second year. So find a mentor um, and find a strength within your family. They can feed you well, probably. If they're away, call them. Um, they might not be able to exactly understand what you're going through, but they have the best intentions behind. So, mm -hmm. I think that's good. And um, Belinda, do you want to add to that about being a first generation? Yeah. Um, so it's funny you mentioned that because I was like, just having a conversation like this yesterday with one of my classmates because her dad is a podiatrist and so her mom um went through podiatry school when her dad was a podiatry school I mean she, she was his support so they both understand what she was going through and I told her you know you're lucky that they kind of understand that what you're going through because your dad went through it so he knows firsthand and then your mom was there I was like and with me sometimes I still struggle I was like my mom is barely starting to understand that now um she's the one that like really stays on top of like what's going on with me because she sees how stressed out I am like I live with her and there will be weeks on end that I won't see her even though we live in the same house like I'll come home really late and she's asleep um she wakes up really early to go to work and then I'm asleep so 
um, there would be weeks that I don't see her. And when I do see her, then it's like more of like catching up. And then I would tell her, I'm like, oh, I have like this big final coming up or something. And like, she's pretty much like my biggest cheerleader. Like she'll text me or even like the day out, she'll go wake me up and like give me a hug. She's like, you have to like, good job and good luck on your final today or something. And it's like those small things that honestly keep me going because they really do help. Because it's like, even though she doesn't know exactly what it's like, she sees day in and day out how much I'm always studying and she tries to relate that to everyone else and like tells them like no you know she's really busy um and even my dad who lives here he on the other hand is like well why are you always studying why do you need to go and study on the weekends like don't you just like isn't that enough already and she's like well you see how hard she's been working to get here so she has to do well to continue being there he's like it's not like it's not just a matter of getting to medical school it's a matter of also staying there because Trust me, once you get in, it is so hard. Um, mentally, physically, it is so draining. So, I mean, there will be times when you don't even feel like opening a book or anything, and you really need to find something that works for you. And so I feel like with me, or just being in first generation, it's hard to convey that to your family because they don't really know firsthand. But you have to really try your best to have them see the other side and have them try to understand what you're going through. And even... Like how Raisa said, try to find mentors. That was probably my biggest mistake. Growing up in a Mexican household, we're trained or taught to never ask for help because help is a sign of weakness. And if someone else is helping you, then that means you can't do it yourself, which is wrong. I totally regret thinking that way, but that's just like how I grew up. So during undergrad, I didn't have anyone to like look up to. It took me so much longer to finish undergrad because I didn't have the advice or the mentor or someone to like go to and try to ask for help I would fail classes instead of dropping them because I didn't know that was an option that you can just go and drop a class um and then after I finished it's like okay well what do I do now do I go and find a job so it was more of me trying to navigate through it and I would suggest like try to find those people um whether it's other students who are also first generation and are going through it more they're more than happy to help or other faculty, even if they're not first generation, everyone is more than happy to help. And if you find someone that doesn't want to help and move on to the next person, there will be someone that is more than happy to help because you will have some faculty or some professionals who um, are really busy, honestly. So it's like, there will be people that you'll find along your path that are going to want to help you in some way. And it's just a matter of keeping those people close to you because they're on your side and they're really rooting for you. It's not like people want you to do that. I love that. I think it's very common for us to not reach out to people when we need it, um, especially like depending on the cultures we come from. And so it's very easy to just feel like you're alone in your process and you don't, you just have to struggle through everything. But there's a lot of times a lot of other people could be going through the same thing and you don't even know it. Um, so I totally agree with you. What about you, Jessica? Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I definitely, a lot of my relatives don't understand why I decided to go back to school. They were like, why do you want to go to school and go be in debt? And then, you know, and then it's hard. Like you always say it's so hard. Why did you decide to do that? And also I come from a Filipino family. So they always slight me and say, you should have just done nursing. But luckily I have two parents who, um, they blindly support me. They don't know what I'm doing, but they're my little, my little cheerleaders on the side. Like Belinda said, like they're there to support me, even though they don't understand what I'm doing or how I'm feeling. Sometimes they cook me food. They, they grab me out of my room. They're like, let's go get some boba. Like, and it's always like what Belinda said, it's the little things that matter. And like, because of them, it pushes me to want to do really good in school because I'm the first one there. I'm like, being supported by them because um, my parents also help me out a lot, even though they're all the way in Washington. And yeah, so I definitely agree 100% that you should find a mentor. I found really good mentors in the year above me. And I, I feel like I wouldn't survive without them. <laughs> and Kasi? Yeah, uh, so the the two two things uh are so you it's like a for me personally like making a breakthrough right 
being the first generation is like breaking a barrier. And then, then once you break that barrier, then what really, really matters to me is, uh, I mean, there's an, an excitement. Oh, I was able to be a medical professional. That's good. And then how to set an example for my nieces, my nephew, or whoever from the Togolese diaspora, mm-hmm. right? They will say, oh, he's a medical professional. You know, you can ask him and they, and they can give an example, right? To not only my family, but anybody from Togo or from, you know, West Africa, right? And then uh, that's what I fight for every day, right? I want to be the best in whatever field, you know, which is more like podiatry. And so that I can be, oh, this, this, this guy is really, uh, has made an impact. And then, then you can follow the example. So that's what it meant to me. That's why I, I struggle, not struggle, but I fight for every day. You know, I broke the barrier, but I had to maintain it to set an example, being the first generation and then to show people that, you know, I'm ordinary, but I can do it. You know, it, it, it doesn't take, um, somebody really special to do it. Anybody can do it. And then proving that that's really important to me. So that's the way I see it. Yeah. Someone wrote in the comment that they used to be homeless, but it, but they will be a doctor. Yeah. They understand people's pain. And um, they said they'll be a doctor to heal more people and understand yeah. sadness and happiness in life. So thank yeah. you to whoever um wrote that in the comments I think yeah if you've gone through this and you've been able to experience different parts of life yeah. I think it makes you um have richer experiences which will help you to become a better doctor and yeah. talking about experiences um Riza recently just had a baby so I wanted to ask Congrats. I wanted to ask about what it is like to be a parent in grad school and med school well, thank you, guys. Uh, well, my baby is a month and a half. So it's just recently. <laughs> um, it's not easy, but I think what helped a lot is that before even thinking about the baby, I mean, having the baby and all that, my partner and I went through all this planification. Like we had the months, what rotations I needed to have in. So I could have the pregnancy, for example, um, the first six months, I did the hardcore rotations. So all the greater rotations of the hospitals, uh, the ones that you have a grade on and they're, they tend to be the hardest ones, you know? So I did that. And then the last three months were more towards the school rotations. And those are non graded. You have to participate, obviously, apply yourself, learn a lot, but there is also more um, relaxed about that. It's a little more relaxed. The, the professors and everything is a little bit more fun too. So, um, not that strict. I mean, the other ones are fun too. So, that plan allowed me to be pregnant and still not abandon school, not have to redo any courses. Um, I was still taking my classes and now that baby is here, I'm about to start for the year, which is mostly, you know, as you know, clerkships all over the country, but at least that workload of having the classes is not there. And that helps a lot. That helped a lot for me. This last month that she was born a month, month and a half, that was still finishing this last semester, definitely had a lot of support from my mom, my partner, um, just planning feedings and pumping on the way to school. For example, I, I, I took her the last month. My professor was really nice and let me take baby into school every day for the last month for my last rotation. So uh, on my way to school, uh, my well, before that, like, you know, my fiance will get baby ready, change the diapers. I will be pumping. So then she has enough food when we get into campus so she wouldn't cry during school. And as long as you're organized, I think that it can be done. Not easy, but it can be done. Just a strong mind. <laughs> yeah. You're one of the strongest people I know and you inspire me a lot. So 
Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, my next question for all of you is, um, how do you manage to pay for medical school? Like a lot of um, pre-health students are asking about the, like if you take out loans or how you are able to afford to um, live and go to medical school. Um, Kasi, do you want to start that? Yeah, uh, so for me, it's mostly loans. Right. Um, I don't have, I'm a first generation. Even my, my mom and my dad, they don't know about loans. Right. So I have to really research. And I mean, I started taking loans during undergraduate, like I got some scholarship, but I took loans too. So it's it, me, I was like, you know, high, I'd say 80, 70% loan. And then, then I worked during my gap year. So I saved money too. But that help that's only helped me this first year, right? So it's mostly loans uh, for me. Um, other than that, but I, I look at it as like an investment. I did, the only thing I would say is like to not take a loan from a private company, right? If you're going to take a loan, the best way to not take a loan, right? But uh, so taking a loan, take it for like a government loan that you know you have more option to pay back. But from, from like private company, that's really like high risk. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's mainly loan. And then there's, I, I, I would not, I, I would say that somebody cannot let loan stop you from pursuing being a medical professional, right? Because there's other, or other, after you graduate, there's other things that you can do to have your loan, um, you know, have paid or have forgiven or those, there's, there's always a way, you know, so to not let, let money stop you from uh, pursuing your dream. That's, the, that's, that's what I did. I don't think about my loan. I don't think about the money. Of course, be, um, to not take a high risk loan, but don't, don't let it stop you. That's the way I, I would say. Yeah. What about you, Jessica? So I take out uh, a few loans also from like FAFSA. And then um, my parents also help support me. They help me pay some rent. I also like a part of it because I pay my, I live with my grandma here. Mm -hmm. And so I pay a little, I pay her a little bit of rent. Mm -hmm. And then they help me with food and part of my tuition. So I'm, I'm very lucky. But um, a lot of my friends, they also took out loans from FAFSA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you, what about you, Belinda? How, how are you affording to go to Um, Honestly, what everyone else said is loans. Here's the thing. Don't be afraid of loans. I know I was really afraid of loans in undergrad. So I would work full time and go to school full time. And my grades suffered from that because like there'd be times I would do like overnight the day right before an exam. And it was because I I was raised like, oh, no, loans are bad. You should never like have any loans and like, oh, and you want any money. And um, like I said, my grades suffer for that. It took me longer to finish because of the fact that I was always trying to not take out any loans and I like, pay for everything by myself. And it wasn't until I got into my master's program there I had to take out loans because there really isn't any financial aid for after having your four years after your bachelor's at that point the government believes that you have now a career and therefore you should be able to afford it so the only thing is just having loans there's no grants um besides there are scholarships so at that point when I really learned learned that you should take loans um I felt so seen I was talking to one of my advisors and she said well why are you working in undergrad and I told her oh well because my parents don't have money they weren't going to pay for it so well, why don't you just take loans and I just I stayed quiet and she's like because you were raised in a home where they're probably telling you loans are bad and you shouldn't owe anyone anything. And I was like, oh, how did you know? Like, you're out of my mind. Like, did you know my family or something? And she was like, no. She's like, that is a common conception in every family. She's like, that's usually what the thing is. She's like, but honestly, she's like, once you get into your profession, like the amount of money you'll be making, that should not be a worry. You, sh you will be paying for it. She's like, and it's not like you're going to end up being sent to collections and it's true like once I finished my master's I started working and I would just give the minimum payments and you're going to get back to school and it's not like 
you would have like collections coming in and like telling me, oh, I owe so much money for my master's. I need to pay it off or something. Or I can't um, open up a credit card or like buy a car or anything, which is not the case because these are federal loans. <coughs> loans. So it's like the government is investing in you. That's really what it is. So don't be afraid of them. Um, once you graduate, there will be different programs that can go ahead and assist with paying off your loans. I know that in like the west coast states um i know i like can arizona and utah if you apply and you work for them for a certain time i can't remember if it's like five or ten years they will go ahead and wipe out your loans um some of them is like if you work in a rural area for like 10 years they're going to go ahead and wipe out your loans no matter how much you owe already and there's scholarships also that you can apply for um i just recently applied for a scholarship at school so every bit counts um, but honestly, at the end of the day, the amount of money that you'll end up making, like once you're in your career and once you're attending, then it would not be a worry. And it's, I'm not saying you're going to pay off your loans in a year or in two years. It might take a while, but it's not to the point where you won't be able to live. Like you'll be able to continue paying for your loans and still live comfortably. So as long as you're able to reach your goal and don't stop going to school because you don't want to stop going to school and have those loans, if you want to make sure you finish, then you'll be fine. Yeah, it's it's called public service loans, and if you pay it for ten years, um, you could pay it off. But I mean, the first year out DPM person after residency, you make a quarter of a million dollars, which is, you know, in the top one percentile in California. Now, uh, other places maybe a little bit lower, but um, yeah, and and the part of it too is the California has a couple of loan programs that if you go to federal. Uh, Better health qualified health centers or uh, work for the VA. The VA has loan repayment programs. Um, pretty much if you go to the VA, you're working for the government. So they don't want to owe themselves money. So they'll figure out uh, ways. Um, also that you can negotiate if you're really good, you can negotiate um, loan repayment when you sign on somewhere. Um, I know a friend of mine who uh, was went to a group and then was going to another group and the other group was like, well, you know, I have uh, $300,000 worth of debt. So they kind of set up a plan that was in five years, the practice would pay it. So uh, once you have that degree, if it's DPM, MD, dentistry or whatever, like you have something that most people want and they are willing to pay for it. So, and like I said, I've never met a, a starving podiatrist or physician or dentist you know and that you can always find a job and the only ones that are not working is because they don't want to so yeah definitely uh Riza, did you want to add anything to that well, i think i agree with everything you guys are saying uh loans just taken uh obviously just be smart about how how you spend it because there's definitely extra money for, for me i think it was the first time in my life that I had such a generous amount per month. So just plan really well. And if there is always something extra, just do it towards the interest. That's really good too, just so it doesn't accumulate. And then as you guys mentioned, that there is uh, many repayment plans. So worry about that later, but don't let money get in the way of you becoming the physician you want to be. Yeah, definitely, I agree. And I think some students ask like, if they should still work during medical school. But I, I feel like we all agree that it's almost not possible to keep a part-time or full-time job. Like in undergrad, like in, in grad school, it's, it's too much, I think. Because, you know, once you start podiatry school, I feel like that should be your main priority to get through. And so if you have a job, you don't want that to get in the way or to make you too tired to study. Um, my next thing that I wanted to talk about is how you deal with burnout. Um, if you have dealt with burnout in school, um, if so, how did you get through that? Um, and if you haven't dealt with that, then how do you keep yourself mentally uh, healthy, I would say. Uh, we can start with uh, Jessica. <laughs> So I did get a little bit burnt out, but I find that like after exams, I take the whole day off. I will not go and study anything else the whole day. 
and I treat myself out a little, my favorite, my guilty pleasure. I love to eat. I love Korean barbecue, love all these <laughs> hot pot. Yes. So I treat myself out to that. And, um, me and my other classmates, sometimes we'll, we'll just go out because you need a break. You're not a robot. So honestly, every once in a while, you do need to treat yourself. You're going to grind. You're going to grind. Then you got to treat yourself. Got to find something to keep you going. Definitely agree. I feel like that's how actually Rise and I got to be close. It's like after, after our, we were taking physics, I think in community college together. And after those labs, <laughs> we'd look at each other and we'd be like, ah, oh, do you want to get far? <laughs> and we'd get like Vietnamese food. And then we would just, we just bonded that way. So I think it's a great way to de-stress and get to know your classmates better and just stay healthy. So I totally, totally agree with you. What about you, Belinda? How do you, how do you stay mentally healthy or um, deal with burnout? Um, I would say definitely do something that you enjoy and don't stop doing that because you have to make that time for yourself. Um, school will consume you if you don't take that time for yourself. Um, the example I always give it's like I started school in June because I was doing like this intensive anatomy course right before we started like a regular school year and I remember I even got to the point where I was dreaming that I was in the lab and someone was asking me hey what's the muscle in charge of the ipsilateral contraction <laughs> of the back and I like woke up and I'm like I don't know what's that muscle I was like freaking out and I was like okay if I can't even rest in my dreams like this is getting bad I need an outlet so I actually got into working out a lot more mm -hmm. um I used to run a lot and then after that I was like I need to find some sort of outlet so I um definitely got into like working out so I always give myself an hour in the morning before classes and whether it's like waking up really early at five or six or even if I have like an exam or something that day then I try to do it in the evening because I feel like that's my my time it's like and I'm so busy dying from the workout that I definitely don't think about school because I'm like trying to focus and I'm like I'm just trying to finish this workout right now and sometimes you just need something to clear your mind whether that's like reading a book like taking some time off talking to a friend I know like I the really first person that's really close to me is my mom so sometimes I'll be on the phone with her for hours and just be like catching up like oh yeah your aunt did this because like they work together so it's like having those conversations really do keep you level and that's what's going to help you with burnout but don't be afraid because you will hit a time where you're going to hit a wall. Um, there will be times you don't want to study. Like right now, I mentioned earlier, we're going into board studying. As soon as like this last block ended, I was just tired. I would open up a book and try to start board studying. And I'm like, that thing is getting in my head right now. I, like, I really need to give myself some time. And don't feel guilty for doing that because your body needs that time to recover. Like Jessica said, we're not robots. Like you're going to have to find those things that you enjoy and fill your body with those things that you enjoy in order to keep going. Um, one thing that I tell people too is like usually on the day of the exam, um, there's this like coffee shop called Tierra Mia. So they have this really strong Cuban coffee. I love coffee and it's like super strong because it's Cuban. So every morning right before my exam, I go to Tierra Mia and I buy that Cuban coffee because I was like, first off, it's a treat to myself and it's like treat yourself. <laughs> and then second off, like it's so strong and I need something strong to keep me through the exam. But I see it as like the treat to myself is like, okay, you've been studying so hard. You're getting to this point. This is your treat before your exam. So like find something to treat yourself and make yourself feel better. Mm, I definitely agree. I actually like the dream thing happened to me this week. It was like after my pharmacology final, but I was still dreaming about like all the drugs and how I was not remembering one of the drugs. <laughs> But I was like, wait, I, I already finished that final. I don't have to, like, I'm okay. I need to move on to the next thing. Um, Kosi, how do you stay uh, How do you stay mentally healthy? Um, so I pretty much de-stress, right? Yeah. And then I like the outdoor. So I like, you know, I'm a runner. I'm not a marathon, but I like short distance. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm also hiking. So I'm exploring the area. So I will go and then just go to the, the hiking trail. I will go, um, just go out or the nature. I like the nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, connecting with the nature helps me a lot, right? Just go and then on a long walk and then also running or hiking and also 
you know, hanging out with like some friend. Um, I don't have a lot of friends. That's just me. I don't think you need to have a lot of, a lot of friends, but I have a, a really close need that I just could hang out with. Uh, so the, uh, the outdoor, just get out, you know. Sometimes I would just go in and I talk to random people, just trying to make friends, right? Try to get my mind off school. Sometimes I think, okay, like after the exam, I'll think, okay, there's no school, right? I'm like, so I try to section, compartmentalize things. Once I know, okay, this day is all school, I will give 110, 100, like more than 100% of my time to that. And once I'm done, I'm done with that, then I will go do something like go chill, do something really 100%, have fun. And then when I, when I know, okay, I'm in the compartment of this is school time, it's like school time. I'm, I will get really, really, really serious about that. And then so kind of like making that balance, right? Because you don't want to weigh on one, one side and then getting a deficit on one side. So that's what I can like compact my last thing. I know what is that time for crunch. I just crunch whatever I can. I don't have an excuse for that. And right. I like I like the nature, connecting the nature. Yeah. Yeah. I think being able to go outdoors, because I feel like when we're studying we're when we were in COVID, but even now, like when we're studying, it's always indoors. So getting fresh air, going outside. And we're in California, so it's it's a great place to be able to get to see some nature and get some fresh air. So I think that's a definitely great answer. What about you, Riza? I love Zumba. So I'm a Zumba senora. <laughs> I love going and just dancing. You know, um, I used to do it more often, but um, definitely just being able to sing and dance and be be present at that moment enjoying music made me very happy so I tried to do it as almost every other day in the afternoon late afternoon after I was done that was my reward so that's my short-term relaxation plan and then my uh well also I love eating out with friends or family the movies was another outlet so Tuesdays five dollar Tuesdays best part of it so you can you know, um, my fiance and I will go to almost every movie <laughs> for the past years and years, but definitely just have a little moment to just decompress. We'll have like 8 p.m. over to 11 p.m. So then I could study through the day and then could look forward to that. And then for long terms, I really love traveling. So um, I will see my calendar and whatever there is, is three or four days and it's very affordable, then I will just book that and so we'll be looking forward to that so mentally it helped me to plan and, and do good so then that reward comes after so. mm, that's yeah I think that's all really great like making sure to make time for um just great vacation even or to go out to go to the movies I think that's all really important um someone asked in the chat should they retake a class if they get a C? This is probably an undergrad. Um, if they get a C, would you recommend that, them to retake that class? Honestly, I feel it depends on what the class is. Um, let's say if it was like biochemistry, I would say definitely retake the class because biochemistry is going to come back in the MCAT when you take it, and it's going to come back in medical school. So the stronger your foundation is when it comes to that science, then the better off you'll be. If it's like, something else that is not in the sciences um then I would say um, don't worry about it too much um because one C is not going to end up making a big difference in your GPA now if you have like 20 C's or something in your GPA then yeah that makes a difference um but I would say look at the class and you can talk to an advisor a pre-med advisor about that like is it something that you feel is going to end up hurting you so just look at what what class that is and if you feel that it's a subject that you're struggling with. It's better to struggle it, struggle with it now in undergrad than when you get to medical school. Mm. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Uh, I think that, that that's the, the, the best answer uh, because also asking the admission counselor if this, the importance of the class if it's not that important, you know, 
so I won't waste my time taking it. Uh, and also make sure that whenever you take it, just if you get a C, get an A, shoot for the A, right? Because you really wanted to prove that, okay, you got to see maybe something happened. So just make sure you get higher, even higher that you 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 really kill it when you want to retake it. Because if you got given a second chance, you really have to prove that you are the best. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, it's, and it's seen that if you have to take it, if you don't have to take it, don't worry about it. Personally, I think the MCAT is the, the defining factor, right? So I'd rather focus my time on taking the MCAT, doing well on the MCAT. That will open the door to many things than just focus, focusing on wanting to retake one class. Yeah. Did you want to add anything to that, Raisa? Yes. So for, um, like Belinda was saying, and I agree with all of you that if you um, are going to retake it, then try to shoot for the best you can do. But also, yeah, it's very important, uh, like Kosi said, to reach out to which schools you really are interested on and say, hey, this is this is transparent, you know, this is what I'm working on. Do you think that it's going to impact my admission? Or and so that way, if they say no, then you know, sometimes classes are expensive. So you can go online, find your resources and get a stronger and prepare for medical school because you know inside that that's a class you are um, weak about. But besides that, I think it depends, but reach out to the counselors. They're the best for that. Mm -hmm. the, the, only, the only thing that I would add is if you're going to retake a class or even the next class, learn why you got to see and improve your technique or your the, the things that you do because if you're going to do the same thing over again you know you're going to get the same result and Albert Einstein used to call that insanity and so just see what you did wrong maybe you were studying wrong or you were using it you know use a different technique know your learning style um, and I think all of those are really important just don't do the same thing again hoping that oh I'm going to get a better grade uh, because even though you've seen the material before, you may uh, you may do a little bit better, but you may do the same thing, and that's a lot worse than if you take it again and get another C. It's like you know, so learn your mistakes because, um, and even if you get a class that you get an A in, it doesn't mean that you've mastered it. So having you know understand like okay, did I really understand the stuff? Because there's been classes that I've taken that. I've got A's in them, and if you ask me about it, I'll be like, I don't, I don't remember. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's really important as well. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think I agree with everybody. Um, but just in these last couple minutes uh, that we have together, I wanted to ask if you have any just advice for someone that's considering podiatry as their path. Um, we can start with Belinda. I would say that this is a great profession. Um, there will be some things said about it. There's going to be some outside noise. Ignore it. The best way to know whether this is for you or not is to actually be involved. So find someone a shadow. I know someone had asked where you can find someone a shadow. I know a AACP um, website can find you someone a shadow in your area. Um, and even if you don't go to the CPM, AA CPM website, you can actually just do a Google search of podiatrists in your area and just go to their office. And I'm pretty sure they're going to be more than happy to help you to find someone to shadow um, if, they, if you can't shadow them. Um, another thing would be go to conferences. When you go to conferences and see a lot of podiatrists presenting, that's when you really realize the things that you can do in podiatry. And that, at least for me, it inspires me to continue going. Because it's like, oh, my God, there's so many innovations or so many things involved with it. So the more you're involved with the field, the better off you'll be. So whatever bad things you hear about it, I would say just ignore it. Sometimes those people are unhappy or they're not in the field themselves. And the best way to get your information is to go directly to the source, which would be to be involved with the field. I totally agree. What about you, Jessica? So this is a great profession, like Belinda said. I definitely agree. You should find someone to shadow so you know what it's really like. 
you can do different settings. You can go private practice, hospital, um, and you can see what you like. It's not all the same. So you can see different specialties. Um, I also think that you, I know some people are pushed to go to medical school straight after they get out of school, but I think that you, it's the best that you find that you're ready to give a hundred percent for the next four years of your life. So just make sure that you're ready and you're ready to give it all your all basically. Yeah. What about you, Raisa? I will say uh, carefully consider it because you're committing to this amazing specialty and is um, you, you don't want to just, you know, over um, change your mind later. So like, like adding to it, find your mentors, um, shadow physicians. Once you're in is to me the most rewarding professions of all. You have so much to do, you're never bored, you have so many subspecialties. And then if we add the realistic part of financially, it's really good too. Has all the pluses for a physician. So for physicians, we're surgeons, um, just think about it before you're gonna do it. But once you do it, I think you're gonna find happiness. And that's the most important part for me. I'll be happy and healthy and it's not easy, but as you see, you're seeing here, all of us are going through it or have gone through it and you see the other side and it's really great. So please feel feel free to reach out and be into every um, webinar that you can, involve yourself, ask many questions. It's okay to ask all the questions you need. And then I think you're gonna find a great path in profession with Poliatry. Great, and then Kosti, any last words? Yeah, so just getting involved, don't just jump into it, right? So be doing, like seeing it yourself, being involved, going to a conference and then connecting with different uh, podiatrists. And then uh, also, if you can see yourself doing it and be happy with it and then helping people at the same time, then it's, 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 it's a good fit for you. But if you see yourself, you feel like, okay, I cannot do this. I, I'm not going to be happy with it. Then don't, don't do it. But if you see yourself doing it and then being happy with it, then, you know, you know, do it. And then just be patient. Don't just jump into it. Just do your getting involved. And then uh, you just, that's what I can say. Great. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I Um, and I hope that you'll have a great rest of your day. And I think if any participants want to reach out, um, I'm sure they can find you on Instagram um, or email. If you want to put your email in the chat, that's if you're comfortable, you can do that. Um, but yeah, just want to thank you so much. And we'll start the next session, which is the panel with current pod podiatrists. And of course, you guys are also able to stay on if you want to ask any questions too our great podiatrist that we're going to have on. But thank you so much.